The presence of God is in this place. He's here. He's always with us. The Holy Spirit is always with you. He's always right next to you. Even though we quench Him, even though we grieve Him, even though we push Him aside, He is there. I cannot tell you the amount of times this week where just listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit has caused things to happen, saving me from accidents, saving me from destruction, causing people to be touched, causing people to have encounters with God, experience God, having a life turnaround moment. Something even as simple as a word in a message that could have been bad, changed. The Holy Spirit just leading, just make sure on that. He's there all the time. He's there with you all the time. Unfortunately, a lot of times we get so used to and so familiar with the presence of God. We get so familiar with this atmosphere. As encounter, we are blessed. We are fortunate to have this atmosphere every Sunday. So to you guys, it might seem, okay, it's just a normal Sunday. But go to another church and no disrespect to any, any other churches. Go to another church and just sit there for a moment. You'll come back and you'll cry and you'll weep before God because there's an atmosphere that's here in encounter. We need to make sure that we don't become familiar with the presence of God. Because in that time is where we miss a lot of what God has for us. When we're not obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit, where He leads us, we miss out and we lose out on job opportunities, on heavenly rewards, because we don't minister to somebody that God needed to encounter that day. So when you come to church, when you worship, when you praise, when you're listening to an offering message, when you're giving an offering message, when I'm preaching, when I'm standing there, when I'm having to minister to people, sensitivity. And as we've been teaching you with the anointing um, series that we've been doing, it all takes time in the secret place. But a lot of times we can't get to that every day. What we then fall into is condemnation. And we allow the voice of the enemy and ourselves to condemn us. But now I'm not good enough. But yet you can talk to God every moment of your life. This afternoon I was saying to him, I'm like, God, you need to help me. I can't find an outfit. To some it might be like, what are you doing? But that's my relationship with God. That's me fellowshipping with Him and saying to Him, you need to help me because nothing was working. But it takes sensitivity. The whole, when I say the whole week, I mean the whole week. I'm not saying this so you can feel bad about yourself, or, but I don't have it. If I can do it, somebody who comes from nothing, I don't have anything behind my name, not one thing. I barely have a matric behind my name. Barely. Nothing. No studies, no courses, no Christian this or Christian that, nothing. But it took years and years and years. I'm only 28, but it took years since I was a little girl of surrender of yielding, acknowledging, knowing who's there with me. It took nights and nights and nights and nights and days and days and days of tears, crying out before God, seeking His face, talking to Him day after day after day after day, not just in a secret place. When I'm driving my car, when I'm going here, when I'm going there, it's so easy you guys can have your seats. But it's so easy. This world that we live in, we know it's a world. But the spiritual realm, the spiritual dimensions, it is so fascinating. 
But a lot of us are limited by our minds. A lot of us are limited by our perceptions. We're limited by our insecurities that we allow. As a born again believer, the enemy has no right over your life. Even though your parents might have done certain things, even though there might be generational curses and all that stuff, he doesn't have a right. And the moment that you realize the authority that you carry, the moment you said, I accept you as Lord of my life, you were given an authority over all of those things. He has no right. He has no right. But you allow Him to have that right. You allow Him. And then we have to deal with those curses. We have to deal with those things in deliverance and all that stuff. I'm not saying deliverance is not important. It is, of course, very important. But if you just know the authority that you have from day one, not from 10 years down the line. You grow in your anointing. You grow in your grace. You grow in knowledge. You grow in all those things. I understand. And we do that. But if you would just understand who you are, whose you are, and not for a day, and not for a service or a night after a service, the moment you open your eyes, you know And you walk in that day knowing the authority that you carry. You go to work with that authority. You step into a boardroom with respect, with honor, with submission, all those things. Because that is godly principles. We're representing God. Everything you do, you represent Him. Unless you've told people you're not a believer and there's no signs on you then you're kind of representing yourself. But then you're not saved. Because when you get saved, it's a complete turnaround. When you truly get saved, it's a complete turnaround. You choose to carry on with the things that you've done, that you used to do. You allow that bondage to be over you. A lot of people want to use excuses and say, but you know, This is hard. It's difficult. It's not. It's a choice. You have the authority over that stronghold, that bondage. Everything in life is a choice. And I can't make the choice for somebody else. I can teach you how to surrender. I can give you an example of what we do. But you need to choose to surrender. You need to choose to accept what God has said about you. What the Word promises you every day. People read the Bible as just a storybook or of things that maybe happened. Some people struggle to believe a lot of the things that happened. Some people do believe what happened, but they struggle to bring it into the now, into their reality of now. How is this relevant for me? The Bible is a history book, but it's also a book of guidance. It's a book of example. It's a book filled with promises, with your inheritance. Everything is locked up in there, everything. And your relationship with the Holy Spirit and your intimate time with God in your secret place, it's what gonna, what's going to get you to have that book become a reality for you. In the same way with the spiritual realm, a lot of people, you know, think angels are just for profit to see or encounters like that is just for profit to see. But a lot of people don't even know that there's angels all around you, protecting you from car accidents, causing your going before you in a job interview, setting the atmosphere, working on those people's hearts, working with them. They're there all the time. A lot of people have made a, how can I say it, like have downplayed angels. The reason for that is because a lot of movies or websites or those things portray a certain picture about angels that 
downplay them. And even though we are greater than angels according to the Bible because we were made in the image and likeness of God, they still play such an important role. We put ourselves lower than them because we don't know who we are. We don't know the image we were made in. We don't know the likeness that we were made in. And we put ourselves under angels. Yet we are higher than them, but they are just as important. Everything in the kingdom of God is important. Everything. And with angels, their functions and, impo- uh, uh, and what they do is so important. Now, we're obviously teaching about angels, and that was not where I was going to go, but that's where we went. And I'm just going to teach you, you know, working with angels. And in that sense, I'm just going to tell you, a lot of us know a little bit about angels. But as you know, I like to teach. I like to have notes. I like to give you stuff just to increase your knowledge in this subject. They're there all the time. As Prophet has said, we have our angels that are with us, our personal angel that's with you all the time. John was telling me in the car that when he was at our house the other day, Prophet and I were busy in our rooms preparing and he was busy in the lounge. And while he's there, I don't remember what he was doing, but he was doing what he was doing. And he kept thinking that Prophet and I are walking past, but we were in our rooms because we're preparing. Well, I was preparing and he was resting. So our angels are walking in our house. He's experiencing our angels in our house. Our children see that their angels, as Prophet said, Scarlett saw her angel the other day with no fear. The spiritual realm is exciting. The kingdom of God is exciting. Christianity is exciting. And if you don't have that excitement, that hunger, and that desire for more, to be used by God more, to be, I don't know, to go deeper with God, to see more things, to experience more things, to be used more by Him, to be able to walk up to a person and say, listen, this, 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 and this. Then we need to pray for you. And I can pray for you and God can touch you, but you still have a responsibility to go deeper. You know, we've said it before where you, you know, we can start a fire. You need to keep that fire going. We then can restart it at another time, but you need to keep that fire going. You need to add more wood to that fire. Keep the fire burning. Keep it going. Amen? Okay, I need to get into the message before I go over time. Amen. Are you excited, church? Are you ready to be used by God in 2022? Are you ready to walk onto the streets and walk to somebody and just look at them and come up? You guys are not ready. I just told you how the excitement and the joy of God needs to be on your life. God works through vessels on this earth. And if you're not going to make yourself available, if you're not going to step out and be that vessel that He can use, He will walk past you and He will find somebody that is willing and ready to do it. He's not going to say to you, take my hand, now lift up your hand, put your hand on that person's head, now pray for the person. He's not going to say to you, walk to that person, now look at them, touch their hand, and say this, this, this. No. He's going to say to you, go minister to that person. You walk towards them. Then you look at them. You take their hand. God speaks to you. This and this and this about their life. It takes one step of obedience. God speaks more. Then another step of obedience and God speaks more. But He's waiting to see if you are hungry. If you are desperate, if you are willing to be used by Him. A lot of people go through life not 
excited about life, just going through the motions, just focusing on themselves, focusing on their issues, focusing on their problems. And saying to God, why are you not using me? He's answering you and saying, I'm trying, but you're not listening. And if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. At Encounter, and I say this with confidence, at Encounter, you guys are privileged. There's so many churches that don't teach, that don't impart. They want to keep it to themselves. But in this vision, in this mandate, God has given us the ability to activate the gift that is inside of you. And we activate it, but you need to step out and go and do. It is not only our function to do that. It is your function, your responsibility. And you have all the help. You have the whole of heaven backing you up. The whole of heaven. But we're so caught up in our own lives. We're so caught up in this world that we don't realize and we don't conceptualize the reality that we're actually living. We are in this world, but not of this world. We are from a whole different other place, a whole other dimension. We are just here for a reason. We are here for a purpose. Oh, you guys better get fired up. Oh, you better get ready. Encounter, you better get ready. Okay, I, th- I assume the people that are sitting down are not encounter people. All right, I really need to get into this. Okay, let's go to Hebrews 1 verse 14. So we're going to teach on working with angels. And I'm going to try and stick to this, but I feel so much fire, so much excitement, so much brewing inside of me that I literally want us to walk out of this door now and walk up and down these streets, knocking on the doors of people and ministering to them, saying, did you know there's a God here that loves you? There's a God here to meet your needs. There's a God here to heal every circumstance that you're going through. There's a God here to heal the physical impairments in your body. Oh, come on, somebody. You know, sometimes I wish we didn't have to stay here. Online, I think we're going to stay here just for you. I'm not just saying this. I'm excited. I can't get to this message. There's different kind of angels. There's lots of them. We know about angels. They're amazing. They're with us. They're protecting you, all these things. Okay. Let's try. Okay. Hebrews 1 verse 14. I think we said it. Okay. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Now, angels uh, referred to as ministers are heirs to salvation, or they ministers to those that will inherit salvation. So it means every person who has salvation, who's received salvation, the angels are there to minister to you. They do not minister to unbelievers. Okay. So to those people who, once you inherit salvation, they will begin to minister to you. They work hand in hand with believers. So when angels work, when they operate, they work hand in hand with you. We work in fellowship with angels to assist in the healing and deliverance taking place in other people's lives, in believers' lives. But these ministering spirits, the angels, They have different offices and functions, as most of you know already. So let's look at the different types of angels and their functions in service to God. Amen? Amen. Are you ready? Tonight you are leaving with a new fire, with a new hunger, with a new passion, with a new desire to do the works of God. If you're in this place and you've never walked up to somebody, taken their hand and prayed for them, you need to go to the petrol station after this and you need to walk to somebody knowing who you are, 
whose you are, you say to them, come here. I'm ready. The fire of God is on me. And I'm about to show you who the one and true living God is. Now, don't just shout yes and you don't do it. Okay, so the first angel that we're going to look at is the angel of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. So, the angel of the Lord is the first major player we need to explore. Because there's a lot of confusion about who the angel of the Lord is. So let's look at the Bible to see what it says. In John 5 verse 39, it says, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But we know eternal life is in Jesus. Okay, that's not part of the scripture. I'm just adding it. So you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. So remember, when the Old Testament authors makes reference to the scriptures, so that words, the scriptures, they are referring to what we know as the Old Testament. The word scripture comes from the Greek word graphe which means holy writings, as you know. And the verse clearly states that it is the scriptures that testify of Jesus. Are you with me? Meaning in the Old Testament. So especially the first five books of the Old Testament, they testify of Jesus. And those books are the books of Moses that he wrote. So let's look in the New Testament what Jesus had to say about Moses. So in John 5, verse 46, he says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. So this scripture is telling us that Moses wrote about Jesus in the Old Testament. Yet Jesus was not yet in the Old Testament in the sense of the bodily form. In Luke 24, verse 27, we see, And Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So it is clear from the scriptures that I just read above that Jesus revealed himself throughout the Old Testament. This is known as the Theophanies. When we find the appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament, this means that before Bethlehem, Jesus was able to appear and participate in several events in the Old Testament. That's what I just showed you there. So Moses spoke about Jesus. So many times Jesus appeared in the Old Testament. or When he appeared, he was referred to as the angel of the Lord. But you need to understand that not every time the angel of the Lord was ministered. Oh, let me say it this way first. We need to understand that even though it says the angel of the Lord, it doesn't mean that Jesus was an angel in the sense of being created or a created being. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? This is teaching in a fire up body. I'm trying. (laughs) Okay, so remember the word angel comes from the Hebrew word malak, which means messenger or ambassador. So the word angel is more of a job description than a state of being. So I'm going going to say it again. When we say the angel of the Lord, referring to Jesus, it doesn't mean he was an angel. It's a state of being. So in this case, Jesus was representing God in the Old Testament. So there are several appearances of, of the angel of the Lord in Scripture where he clearly is either the voice of God or God himself. In a sense, you can see the angel of the Lord as God's sent word, as Jesus in the living word of God. Okay, so when this angel was representing Jesus in the Old Testament, he showed up and there will be, so even when the angel of the Lord appears now, there will be deliverance, healing and restoration. And you see this in Psalms 107 verse 20. So please note 
And I want you guys to take notes of this, that every time you see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, it doesn't necessarily mean it was Jesus. There's two different, there's two different ones. So what's the difference between the two when you see the angel of the Lord? So as we've learned in school, and I think common sense will tell all of us, when it talks about Jesus, it's a capital A for angel. When it does not talk about Jesus, it's a small letter A. Got it. So when you're reading the Old Testament and you see the angel of the Lord, make sure you look for a capital letter or a small letter. Capital letter is Jesus, small letter is not. So every time when the angel of the Lord shows up or showed up, it was to bring direction, to bring guidance, to bring comfort and rest, to bring deliverance, and to bring insight and understanding in a situation. So as these things we've read, where where I've just explained to you where the angel of the Lord came in, and I told you what it was, what, what he did in those times. If we look at Jesus in the New Testament, that's what he did as well. It was to bring deliver. He came to bring deliverance, guidance, comfort, and rest. So I'm going to quickly go through some examples in the Old Testament. I'm not going to go through all because we don't have time. But in Genesis 16, verse 11 to 12, we're not going to put the scriptures up. You see where Hagar and Ishmael, here the angel of the Lord brought comfort and guidance for them. I'm not going to go through the other ones because there's like six other examples. (laughs) But do you understand what I'm saying? So the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament refers to Jesus, if it's a capital A. So that's one form. And he can obviously still be present here today. Then the second angel is the angel of his presence, which is the Holy Spirit. And just like Jesus manifested in the Old Testament, so did the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. He came as the person, wait, let me say, in the Old Testament, we also have the person of the Holy Spirit making an appearance. Are you with me? Are you sure? You can say no. Okay, let's read a, read a scripture for that. In Isaiah 63 verse 9, it says, In all their affliction, he was afflict- afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. We by now know and understand that God relates his presence to his Holy Spirit. So when he talks about his presence, he talks about the Holy Spirit. So as you can see here, the angel of his presence, that's the second form of angels. So let's go into the third one. As most of you know, we have the angel Gabriel, who's the messenger angel. So who exactly is he? In Luke 1 verse 19, it says, And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and to bring these glad tidings. So he is a key player, as we know. We know that Gabriel is one of the main angels, if I can say that way. The most crucial and vital announcements are made by angel Gabriel. So if there's something that God needs, a nation or a um, president or a prophet or someone to know, angel Gabriel is the messenger that God will send. Although he is not a warring angel, the meaning of his name is profound and it carries great spiritual significance. The name Gabriel means warrior of God. Now, although we all believe that he can defend himself if he has to, that's not his main purpose. It's not his main function. He wages war in a different way. To understand the significance of his name, we need to understand his characteristics. So we need to understand the characteristics of angel Gabriel. In Daniel 9 verse 21, it says, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in visions at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reach me about the time of the evening offering. So the first characteristic of angel Gabriel is that he appears in the form of a man. 
this allows him to interact with you without distractions. It's the reason for that is to eliminate fear out of a person's life. If you look at Mary, when angel Gabriel came to her, she didn't fear because of him. She feared because of the message that he brought. So the second characteristic is that he has the ability to, uh, to fly swiftly, quickly. This allows him to complete a task uh, quickly. Therefore, he, he has the ability to deliver the message with speed and accuracy. As believers, we can activate angels to move on our behalf. Now, we need to understand that all God's messenger angels operate in the same way. The most crucial, crucial messages, as I said, is assigned to Gabriel. And there's a way that believers can actually activate angels to move on your behalf. You need to speak what God speaks. Amen. Secondly, remember that all angels belong to God. They are His property. And they, not, they do not belong to us. So we can't, cannot command angels. We cannot tell them to do something. We need to speak the word of God and then they can listen. So thirdly, we do not worship angels as we know. Some people pray to angels. Some people worship angels, but that is not us. So if you've done that, repent. <laughs> we do not worship angels. We worship God. But we can work in fellowship with angels. In fact, God sent angels to serve us. But again, that doesn't make them our property. I said it earlier on, is that a lot of people have placed angels higher than us. But God has made us higher than angels. As we know the story about Daniel, he fasted for 21 days. And all of us know, for those who don't know, that the first day already God had sent the answer for Daniel. He prayed and he asked God to uh, set them free. There was a prophecy that he wanted to get fulfilled. And God had sent the answer, but there was the power of the prince of the air that was there that was limiting him. And Gabriel wasn't able to fight this uh, prince of the air. And uh, Michael had to step in and come and help him because he's a messenger angel. He has a message that is sent from God. So Daniel was praying God's word. As I said, he was praying a prophecy and he was asking God to fulfill a certain prophecy. He was praying God's word. He was interceding for a prophecy to be fulfilled. The Bible also states in Daniel 10 verse 11 and 13 that Daniel's words, oh, I said that his words were heard and then Michael had to come. The angel Gabriel clearly states that he came, in the Bible, if you read the story, Gabriel clearly states that he came because of Daniel's words. So if you are fasting, if you are praying, that will activate God's angels to move on your behalf if you pray God's word. If you pray God's word. They will listen and act on His instructions and commands alone. Okay, let's go into the archangel Michael. He's the military leader. Michael is the only archangel made mention of as an archangel in scripture. However, this doesn't mean he is the only one because the word arch simply means chief or principal. But in Daniel 10 verse 13, we read, it says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days, but lo, Michael won of the chief priests. So we see that Michael's not the only archangel, but it's the one, he's the one that's been made mention of in the Bible. The verse clearly indicates, uh, indicates that Michael is one of the chief priests, meaning that there can be many more, like I said. Michael is incredibly important, as we know. If you know this stuff, just listen again and remind yourself. If you don't know this stuff, let it sink in. I always say that, that we need to 
be brought back to remembrance a lot of what we've learned so that hunger and that passion that we had before can be stirred up again. And we get stirred up through the word. Amen? Okay, so Michael is a military leader. He is the archangel that is mentioned in Jude 1 verse 9. He is the angel that calls us in the rapture. So when the rapture is going to happen, Michael is going to be there. He's going to be the one that calls us. And that is in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. If you want to read the scripture, I don't have time to read the scripture. But Michael also leads the armies of heaven. Imagine, do we have any Michaels in this place? Anybody that is a name Michael? Or a son or a son named Michael? Okay, if you're online and your name is Michael or your son's name is Michael, know what you carry. Know what he carries. He's a born leader to fight. If you have a baby, you can call your baby Michael. <laughs> okay, so in Revelation 12 verse 7, we see that, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Okay, so Michael specializes in war and protection. Any war situation that arises, Michael, will, uh, Michael would be the most preferred angel, especially if it's a crucial battle. He's extremely powerful, and he's the leader God set in charge to protect Israel. Okay, so the fifth angel is the seraphim angels. They, the seraphim means fiery ones, and there's so much to say about them. And yeah, okay, let me explain it because some don't know. So the seraphims is described by Isaiah and John as having six wings. Now, it's interesting because for Isaiah, these angels, when he saw them, two of their wings were covering their eyes, two of their wings were covering their feet, and then obviously they had two other wings. But then when John saw these angels, he had more revelation and he saw the face of these angels and he saw them having uh, four faces, which is one looks like a lion, one looked like a calf, one looked like a man, and one looked like an eagle. These angels have the ministry of fire. So these angels must be with me all the time. <laughs> Amen. Okay, when we declare the baptism of fire, these angels are present. They are the ones who work. It was one of these angels that flew and touched Isaiah's mouth with a fiery coal to remove iniquity. This means that these angels are present in deliverance as well. As we understand that one of the main purposes for the fire of God is to bring purity and to cleanse. So do you understand this, uh, the, these angels, the seraphims? Now let's go to the cherubims. Okay, so I'm just going to explain a little bit about them. So they have four wings each. They have four faces, one of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Their wings make sounds of great waters. As the voice of the Almighty the voice of speed, the wing, their wings is so loud, but yet you can still hear the praise happening in heaven. And as some of you might know, Satan was a cherubim before he rebelled against God. The first place where we find the cherubims is in Genesis 3 verse 24, where God placed these angels to guard the entrance of the Garden of Eden. Bear in mind that the Garden of Eden is a symbol of God's presence. Okay, we again find the cherubims in the book of Exodus 25 verse 18 to 20 where God directs Moses to sculpture two cherubims to cover the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So as you can put together by now, these angels, their function is to protect the presence of God. Again, it is a symbol of something that is actually happening in heaven. To cover the presence of God 
as that is where God appeared to the preach. So when we had the... Um, the mercy seat, and God would appear to the priest. It happened in between two of these angels. So there was one angel on this side and one angel on this side protecting the mercy seat. And God would speak to the priests in between these two angels. Imagine that. So these angels protect the presence of God. So when the presence of God is in a church, when the presence of God is in your home cell, these angels are there protecting the presence of God. They are there protecting what is happening there. They are working alongside you while you are in your home cell and you don't even know it. The responsibility is to protect and cover the presence of God. And it's to uphold the throne of God. I know all of our home cell leaders got excited now. They were like, I can't wait for this week's home cell because the angels are going to be there. And I'm going to know that they're there. Okay, this is profound because it means that where you find the manifest presence of God, there you will find cherubims because they're there to protect the presence of God. Okay, so let's look at some other angels. I'm nearly done. And then we're going to have some fun. We have, 20, we have 34 minutes. Let's see if I can get this done in four minutes. Then we have 30 minutes of Holy Ghost fun. I hope you came for a party. I hope you came to celebrate. Because after this, we are going to break the chains that bind. We are going to dance. We are going to sing. And if you don't want to be part of that, there's the door. But we're going to walk out. You're going to be clothed with something tonight. You're going to know who walks behind you. You're going to know who protects you. And you're going to, even though you already know who's inside of you. Okay, so the Ophanim angels, I think I pronounced it right, they carry the cherubims. They are filled with eyes, which represents the omniscience of God, which is the all-knowing, which kind of makes sense to me. So if they have a lot of eyes, they can obviously see everything. They represent the infallible wisdom of God. Okay, that's one. Then let's go to the angel, Raphael. He is the healing angel. When we say Jehovah Rapha, it, uh, then it means God uh, who heals. Raphael can be broken up into two distinct parts, Rapha and Al. Rapha meaning healing and Al meaning God. God is the master healer. And so this angel is named after God, the healer. So when you see the healing power of God manifesting in a service, these angels are normally present. Amen? Amen? So, and they're present there to assist whoever is ministering healing amongst the people. We don't realize and conceptualize what is around us. There's so much happening in the atmosphere all the time. And I'm speaking from experience as well. There's many times where you go through your day and you don't realize everything that's going on. We have watcher angels or warring angels. There's angels that are constantly fighting a fight, a battle for your life. There's constantly a spiritual battle happening in the heavenlies for your life. They're fighting to protect you. Watcher angels, as Prophet explained as well, these are angels that watch everything you do. Everything you do, everything you say, every conversation you have, every tea you have <laughs> that you have with your Bible, they watch everything. So when you're phoning somebody, gossiping about somebody else, they're watching you. They're taking notes. When you're lying in your bed, 
crying out before God. They're watching you, taking notes. When you're sitting at your desk, pondering, what do I need to do? Talking to God, asking Him what to do. They're watching everything you're doing. Everything. And they record it to give it to God. These angels cannot intervene in a situation. They cannot protect you from something that is not their function. In the same way that every person that God has placed here on earth, we have a purpose, a mission, a mandate, and a function. So do angels. I'm done with that. And I can kind of go through a recap, but if you want to go through a recap, listen to the live stream again. And this is just an angel series. This is kind of like just an introduction. I don't know what Pastor Martin did here last week, but Prophet last week couldn't get to the message that he needed to do because we were just doing deliverances. We were having fun with deliverances. You know, when you understand who you are, deliverance is fun. Healing people or being the vessel that God uses to heal people is fun. Prophesying over people is fun. Getting creative ideas for business and is fun. Walking up to somebody with confidence and boldness and be like, hey, do you know the best person in this universe? Do you know the one person who can turn your life around, who can turn your situation around? Do you know the one person who can heal your broken heart from that divorce that you went through? But you do it with sass. Okay, that's me. I understand not all personalities have sass, but you can have some sass because I can impart some sass. Guys, I did the message and a lot of us understand angels but I came to put some fire back into your bones I came to make you hungry I came to put a fresh hunger inside of you for the things of the kingdom of God I told you last week I hate the devil I hate what he does to God's people. If there's one thing that makes me mad is seeing people allow the enemy to get them down. In our house, we're not allowed to say hate. But the girls come to me sometimes, they say, mommy, I know we're not allowed to say this, but I really hate the devil. I'm like, yes, you're allowed to hate the devil. You're allowed to be mad and angry at the devil. But don't just leave it there. You have the power. You have the authority to step and trample all over them. You just need to know what you carry. At an encounter, you carry a little bit more. At an encounter, it comes easy. You don't really have to work for it. You do. But you don't have to sit in a church where you have to receive everything yourself. We teach you. We equip you. We make it easy. You just need to take it and apply it. Step out and do something. All right, band, you can come up. We're going to dance. We're going to sing. We're going to celebrate. We have a few minutes. If you are here and you're still feeling weighed a weight on your shoulder and you still feel like there's a burden on you, now is the time where you go crazy. If you need to move your chair out of the way, move it over to the side so that you can have place to dance and celebrate. If you want to come to the front, you can come to the front. If you've seen how the youth dance, how the youth celebrate, and you wonder, I just wish I could be in one of those services. Now is the time. Don't hold on to 
the past. Don't hold on to the insecurities. Don't hold on to the words that were spoken over you. You have the power. You have the authority. You have been given all those to break those things. You need to let loose. I don't want to see anybody standing around. But if you want to, you can. If you still have some pride, it's fine. But the rest of us are going to have a party and we're going to celebrate the King of Kings. We're going to rejoice because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We have been given life. We have been given freedom. We have been given deliverance. We have been set free. We have been blessed and we are going higher. If you are ready, encounter. We've been telling you this is the year of your breakthrough. It is the year of your suddenly. It is the year where you step over. Oh, come on, somebody.
inside the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses Righteousness being restored And though these are days of great trials A famine and darkness is worn And still we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare you the way of the Lord Behold, He comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun And the trumpets call Lift your voice It's a hero to believe And out of Zion's seal Salvation God Behold, He comes Riding on the clouds Shining with joy without him in your life if you are in a place where you have depression where you have a lack of joy where you have a lack of self-confidence it's because you're not praising you're not rejoicing the Bible clearly says in all things rejoice Rejoice always in the good, in the bad, in the ugly, in the great times. Rejoice. There's no personality that is too shy or too green. I think that's the one. No personality that can justify for not worshiping God, not praising Him, not giving Him your everything. Jesus died on the cross so that you can be free, so that you can be delivered, so that you can be healed. It's there waiting for you. You have the ability. The Bible says, to make fishes of men. Everybody can talk to somebody. Everybody can minister to somebody. Everybody has the ability to be anointed. Everybody has the ability to prophesy. Everybody has the ability to be used by God to heal the sick, to deliver the people. Some people are willing to step over. Others are not. 
but encounter. We, are, we have stepped over. And we are stepping more and stepping further and going deeper and going deeper. Oh, come on, encounter. You are not rejoicing for me. I don't need you to shout for me. We are piercing the atmosphere. We are breaking the strongholds over your life. We are breaking the strongholds and the principalities over Centurion, over Krugerstorp, over Cape Town, over the nation of South Africa. There's a prophet in the nation of South Africa. When a prophet is in the nation of South Africa, a nation will be preserved. Oh, come on, somebody. (laughs) Prophet said something so profound last week. He said something in the Kruger's Door branch that blew my mind. And a lot of people are going to hate this. And a lot of people are going to manifest from this. But that is their problem. At Encounter, we don't care. Because people didn't call us. People didn't give us a mandate. People didn't give us a mission and a purpose. So he said that a lot of people call themselves Christians, but they are not Christians. They are believers. When you are a Christian, It's little Christs. So when you are a Christian, a true Christian, not a believer, not somebody who believes there's God, who believes in a prophet or believes in somebody, that is a believer. But a Christian is a little Christ. Somebody who acts like Christ, talks like Christ, walks like Christ, moves like Christ. And at at Encounter, we are a a bunch of Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, fireballs, Christians, little Christ. But with this mandate, with this purpose, we have a responsibility. God is going to hold us accountable for this responsibility. So you can carry on your life, carry on going in a normal way, in your normal routine, or you can cross over and you can step into what God has for you. Just one bit of obedience, it starts there. The one morning I was praying, and and, uh, the Holy Spirit led me to pray for a cloth and anoint the cloth with oil. And he said to me, take it to this person. That's all he said, nothing else. Okay, and he said, right, just a little bit of the prayer so they understand. I did exactly that. I got in my car. I actually told the person, I'm coming today, coming to drop this off for you. In my car, I'm praying. The presence of God is so strong in that place, I can't drive. Because my hands are going stiff, my mouth, my eyes are closing. That's how strong the presence of God was on me. Anyway, I get to the place, I'm sitting there, and then he says to me, while I'm there, so I got to the place, while I'm there, he says to me, go into his office and pray over him. So he comes to me, because I didn't have an appointment, I just said to him, I'm coming to drop something off. So when he comes out to receive the thing, I said, I'm coming into your office to pray for you. He's like, okay, let's go. (laughs) So I go into the office and I pray for him. Then I, as I'm about to hand him the cloth, the Holy Spirit says to me, tell him she needs to sleep with this cloth on her chest for seven days. That's exactly what I did. I told him she needs to do that. Then a week goes by and I eventually realize I'm like, Or a few days go by and I'm like, but she hasn't messaged me herself to say anything. And then I just leave it. On the eighth day, she sends me this long message telling me 
that she is completely healed. Completely healed. This is after, this is after months, months of struggling with her lungs. And she is the best doctor in town, if I can say it that way. He could do nothing for her. Yet he has caused how many people to get better? But he could do nothing for his wife. Seven days later, God healed her. But she messaged me and she said, but God didn't just heal my lungs. Every emotional bondage I had, every emotional scar, God healed everything. Everything. Because it was on her chest. Everything. My point in sharing that testimony, because I don't share a lot of my testimonies when it comes to that stuff. My point in sharing that is my first step of obedience led to a second instruction. My second step of obedience led to a third instruction. That third instruction led to somebody being healed physically and emotionally. Being a Christian costs a costly price. It causes you your reputation. It causes you everything in your life. Oh, but I'm telling you something tonight. The price is worth it. The cost is worth it. It's worth it. We're not working for the earth in the sense of just receiving. God will bless you. That's undeniable. But we're not working for this. We're working for the life thereafter. So if you have everything going wrong in your life and your breakthrough just isn't coming through, you say to yourself, Eunice, so you're talking to yourself, Eunice or Esteli, I'm not working for this world. I'm not here to enjoy this world. I'm here with a mission, with a mandate. There's a reason why God is taking me through this season. There's a reason why I'm going through this struggle, why I'm going through this pain, because there's somebody that cannot get to Jesus on their own. They need to hear my testimony so that they can be saved, so that they can have eternal life, not separated from God not caught up in the clutches of the enemy. You have a responsibility and you can do it. Oh, you can do it. If there's somebody that can do it, it's you. It's me. No matter what the world says, no matter what my parents have said, no matter what my friends have said, I can do it because God said I can do it. Oh, encounter, are you ready? Are you ready to step out into the battlefield? Are you ready to wage war on the lives of your friends, of your family, of your colleagues? Are you ready to step out with authority and with anointing and with the glory of God? Are you ready to pay the most expensive price of your life? It costs you your whole life. Oh, but the rewards are great. The joy, the satisfaction, the knowing that you receive from that, oh, it's something else. And some of you, a lot of you have experienced to a degree. Oh, but this year we're going deeper. Oh, we're going deeper. We're no longer living in the first, second, third, or fourth dimension. We're going into the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth dimension. Because God has that for us. All right, encounter, are you ready? I want everybody to raise their hands and close their eyes. Online, I want you to raise your hands and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your call and your purpose. We thank you for drawing us near to you. We thank you for laying down your life so that we can be connected to you once again. Father, if it wasn't for the great price that you prayed, Jesus, if it wasn't for the price that you paid for us, we wouldn't be able to pay the price for you. 
Holy Spirit, we thank you for coming down to be with us, for coming to be our helper, to coming to be our guide. Father, right now I pray for your fire, your glory, your presence, your joy, your peace, your deliverance to fall on the lives of every person in this building, every person that is watching us online. I pray right now that tonight will be a life-changing turnaround moment. Father, I pray for a hunger and a desire and a passion for more of you to be stirred up in the lives of every person. Father, I pray for deeper revelations, deeper encounters with you, with your angels. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, and send all your ministering angels ahead of them to work every situation, all your warring angels to work situations where the enemy has his hooks. Let them begin to minister there and deal with those situations. Father, we thank you for everything. Father, we love you. We adore you. We appreciate you. You are holy. You are worthy. You are mighty. You are so amazing. And there's nothing that we can do without you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love, Father. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for giving us the authority, giving us of yourself, the Holy Spirit, to lead us and to guide us in every way, every way we go. Father, I pray that you would use us even more, that you would use us in a mighty way, like never before, all for your glory, all for your honor, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Now let's give God your greatest ever shout of praise. I want the roof to vibrate. I want the screen to vibrate because of your praise. You're not praising me. You're praising the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh, come on, somebody. Praise Him. leave the building. The rest of us are going to praise for a little bit longer. Come on, somebody. Praise. Praise.
praise who genuinely went to that place and has lost your voice do you see how easy it is to pierce an atmosphere do you see how easy it is to lift a heaviness a burden off of your life it's so easy do this daily daily thank God Daily worship Him, daily praise Him, adore Him, love on Him. Daily, you will see the shift that will happen in your life. The enemy, I'm going to leave you with this. The enemy has no legal right. You open a door. You allow Him. Shut that door. Lock it. Throw the key away. Never again. Amen. All right. Online, we love you. Thank you for joining us. If you are close by and you are not in church, you miss out. If you are far away, you didn't miss out because God encounters you there. Amen. We love you guys. We'll see you in the week sometime for whatever we have in the week. And we'll see you on Sunday. Go out. Make it your mission this week. Every day. Don't be lazy. Don't be insecure. Don't be shy. Step out and see what God will do. Amen. Amen.